Hello and welcome to Worlds Apart. Religion and politics have long been a dangerous mix, perhaps never more so than in the case of the so-called Islamic State. Is this violence and gloating evidence of everything that is wrong with religion, or perhaps how religion can be used as a scapegoat for other less than honorable fields of human activity? Well, to discuss that, I'm now joined by evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Mr. Dawkins, it's a great honor to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Well, um, I know that you've been a critic of organized religion for quite some time, and um, you spoke about religion and evil. But uh, I wonder if uh, the pictures, the footage that uh, we see coming out of Syria, of Iraq, you know, with the Islamic State executions, you know, crucifixions, uh, decapitations, if they leave you shocked, if somebody told you five years ago that we would be dealing with a phenomenon of such proportions, uh, do you think you would be uh, surprised? Of course, I would, I'm totally shocked. I think it's absolutely horrible. Um, you're presumably raising the question, is religion responsible? And religion itself is not responsible for this. These are uh, savage people. Uh, you could ask whether religion is responsible for the, the support that they're getting. And there, I think, it probably is. I mean, the, they are getting support from people in Britain, people in Europe, and, and uh, young men are going out to Syria and Iraq to join IS. And the, the motivation for that is, in some sense, religion. It's also this feeling of um, p political involvement. It's a feeling that it's an us against them. And I think that a, a, a quite a large number of young Muslims feel kind of beleaguered against the rest of the world. And so religion, in some sense, might be just an excuse. But I do think that a dominant part of the motivation for these young men has to be has to be religion. Well, I, I would like to explore that a little bit later, but before we go there, I, if we could look at the biological aspect of it, and I think it, you know, you are an ev evolutionary biologist, and um, probably you would agree that as species we developed some uh, adaptations to sort of uh, prevent us from excessive gore. I mean, killing itself is not easy, you know, and you can argue that perhaps they are savage people and just a bunch of psychopaths, but you know, there are a lot of them. That number is too high to believe that uh, there is something that is, um, you know, psychologically wrong with all of them. So I wonder if um, this type of violence itself is not natural. Because, I mean, they, you know, some people have, for example, faint, fainting reflex at the sight of blood or, you know, it's, it's difficult to kill people with bare hands and they do it very, very easily. Well. A small number of them do. I mean, the, the ones who actually wield the knife are presumably psychopaths, and you probably could find them in any, in any society. But you perhaps you need to make a distinction between them and the people who support them. I, I am worried by the fact that so many people uh, know about these awful decapitations and so on, and yet still join up. Um, that, that, I think you're perfectly right. That is a very worrying thing. Um, as for the biology of it, there's a tussle in evolutionary biology between a tendency to um, selfish violence and a tendency to altruistic cooperation. My book, The Selfish Gene, my first book, is sort of about that tussle. It's, it's somehow sometimes been misinterpreted as an advocacy of selfishness or a statement that we're all selfish. It's not that at all, of course. It's, it's mostly about altruism. But th th there is a kind of tension between selfishness and altruism, both of which are favoured by natural selection, Darwinian natural selection, in different circumstances. But I, I think you argue in your book uh, that um, you know every activity so sort of has a purpose. I mean, even when people resort to violence, it, it has some practical value for them. For example, the survival vi value, what have you. But what I think is very interesting about I ask is they seem to be reveling in that killing and that killing does not really serve any practical role or perhaps it does but it, I wonder if the case could be made that what they do is essentially against basic human instincts because I mean if you look at the, vi at the footage they're stepping over like bodies lying on the street and you can argue that you know just from the biological point of view, smelling decomposing human flesh would be revolting because, you know, we are afraid of catching infections, what have you. But they seem to be, it's almost like their basic instincts have gone numb. How would you explain that? There is a perfectly good evolutionary theory of um, reciprocation in which revenge um, plays a part. And so there can be an escalation 
of vengeance, which can go over many generations sometimes. And so you get vendettas um, in various societies, uh, sort of mafia-influenced societies, um, various societies ar around the world. Killing, often of a hideous nature, is motivated by vendetta, sometimes family vendetta, tribal vendetta. There is a kind of pseudo-tribalism which, uh, which uses religion as a label. And I suspect that some of these people think that the, this hideous violence is vengeance against, say, America for um, attacking Iraq um, or for um, forming alliances with, I don't know, with, with, with Israel, say. Um, and this, this vengeance um, becomes directed towards innocent people. Um, there's one British man who's threatened with execution now, who's an aid worker, whose motivation is purely altruistic towards the people there, and yet he's being scapegoated as vengeance against the United States and British governments. I think vengeance is a, is a hideous emotion, but it is one that does have a biological basis. I wonder if I can pick up on this political point, because uh, clearly, um, as you just articulated, uh, religion or any uh, group of beliefs, they, they're they also a reflection of uh, everyday reality, uh, what the, these people have been exposed to. and. IS originated in Iraq where violence has been raging for pretty much, I don't know, like 10 plus years. The coverage we are getting, especially from Western media of the IS, is that they are you know, a bunch of psychopaths, uh, you know, barbarian sadists, and that may be true, but I wonder if uh, politicians are perhaps exonerating themselves a little bit here, because when you're exposed to extreme violence, not just on a daily basis, but, uh, you know, on for years on end, uh, is, it, is that really surprising that these people are willing to go to such great lengths to...? Y yes, um, but if the causes of... I mean, are, are you saying something like the causes of the violence are um, the, the American invasion of Iraq? I mean, that, that, that sort of thing. Not uh, so much the American invasion, but um, you know, the type of violence that was brought by the war. You know, people exposed to very... Um, you know, gory uh, oh, so, uh, pictures uh, okay. on a daily basis. What you mean somehow w w people get desensitized because they Absolutely, yeah. Well, yes. that's the th first thing that oh, happens in, oh, uh, yes. in any I think war that, zone. That, that does happen. And I think if you look back at, say, the First World War, Second World War, um, the, those things escalated. And, and by the end of the war, people on both sides were prepared to do the most hideous things because they'd seen hideous things already done, yes. Now, um, I consider myself an atheist, primarily thanks to you, but uh, as a, report, a war reporter in the past, I, I've seen many examples, especially in war zones, when people uh, experience so much grief or so much violence that um, religion becomes their only salvation. And it's not only like on an intellectual sort of level. Uh, I don't think they really think about the origins of the universe, uh, you know, when they lose their loved ones, but they really need some sort of support at that time. And I don't think that critical thinking provides that uh, in those days. Uh, do you think that religion still has a place uh, in those societies, the most vulnerable societies, not again as an intellectual concept, but as a you know, uh, social or emotional crutch. Yes, I think very likely it does. I mean, I think it's perfectly possible to say uh, there is no justification of scientific justification for anything religious, for any of the truths that religious people claim. But on the other hand, they, they do provide consolation and so uh, in the same way as a psychiatrist can console somebody by uh, telling them something which may not be true, um, that I could imagine that people do get consolation from religion. What sort of irritates me is, is when people do what, it, what you're not doing, which is to confuse the possible role of religion in consoling people with saying, therefore, it must be true. <laughs> that's, not, that's, that's a total non sequitur. Now, uh I'm speaking here from perhaps my personal experience, but I found that uh, to be an atheist, you need to invest a lot of time and effort into it. You, you have to do a lot of reading, you have to do a lot of thinking. And I think for a lot of people uh, around the world, that's a pure luxury. I mean, they cannot afford an intellectual lifestyle. They perhaps work you know, several jobs or again, live in war zones when you know, they, they would 
love to wonder about stars, but it's simply uh, not part of their life. I wonder if we can, if the case could be made that atheism at the end of the day is, you know, a mark of social and intellectual distinction or status, that th this is something that a lot of people around the world, stricken by poverty or stricken by war, simply cannot afford. Yes, and, and that's true, of course, of, of any intellectual pursuit. If you're, if you're starving, um, you better get on with, with, with trying to survive, and, and it's very, very, very difficult. So all intellectual pursuits, in a way, are a luxury, uh, which privileged people can afford to indulge in. It's the same is true of music, of, of, of philosophy, mathematics, um, all pursuits of the mind are things that we can do when we have the luxury, the leisure to do so. And, and many people, unfortunately, haven't got that luxury or leisure. So would that essentially mean that uh, your efforts to spread atheism around the world are essentially limited to m most fortunate parts of it? I would like to think not, because I think that a lot of, of the problems that the poorer people have may be brought upon them by religion. Um, I don't deny that religion can be consoling to them. But what I'm suggesting is that they may be actually oppressed by religion. I think, for example, of the place of women in Islamic societies, uh, where they are hideously oppressed by uh, religious um, forces. Well, I think we'll get a lot of uh, response to just this phrase that you just uttered, because many would argue that in those uh, societies, uh, what looks like oppression to you is a setup of life that uh, you know, makes it possible for a family unit or for society to exist. It, perhaps not perfect, but this is essentially the product of the circumstances. Allow me to be skeptical. <laughs> well, um, we talked about ISIS and uh, on the political level uh, we can see that it can well, perhaps bring uh, sworn enemies together, like, for example, uh, the United States and Iran. There are some negotiations about them working together. I wonder if uh, the same could apply to religion, moderate religions, and atheists. Do you, th do you think that they could join forces, uh, and if so, in what way in combating this very extreme form of Yes, uh, that's a, per a perennial argument again. I mean, it's, it, it, it came up in the Second World War over... Um, uh, enmities between uh, Britain and the United States and uh, Stalin's Russia. Um, and um, they came together to fight Hitler and then parted again after Hitler was defeated. In the case of uh, atheists and religious people joining together, this comes up in America especially with the argument over creationism and the teaching of evolution, where moderate religious people are on the same side as scientists in wanting evolution to be taught and wanting young earth creationism not to be taught. And I have myself joined up, joined forces with bishops in Britain on this, on this very, very issue. So yes, there are times when one s seeks to make alliances with people that, that one doesn't always see eye to eye with. But uh, when you make those alliances, I wonder, you know, what kind of compromise, intellectual compromise you are making with yourself because uh, um, you know, you, you just decide that you, you're not going to look at their ideology and not going to take it seriously or... Because, I mean, uh, the story, for example, of origin is a very important part of the uh, doctrine. So if, even if you're joining forces with them, how... how well, you say, I, I agree to, we, we agree to differ on, on this, but we feel very strongly about that, and so we're going to join forces mm -hmm. over that. Mr. Dawkins, we have to take a very short break now, but when we come back, how could evolution of religion look like? That's coming up in a moment on Worlds Apart. They dreamt of a land in which life should be better, richer, fuller for everyone, with opportunity for each, according to ability or achievement. They should have been welcomed as heroes. I came home, there was no follow-up call, there was no check to see if I was okay. My insurance had been canceled. They had to begin a new battle in their very own country. I lost the sight of my left eye, three-fourths of my right and I lost my left leg. They have no status. They're not military, they don't have rank, they're not in uniform, they are looked upon 
as long as you can. Right from the sea. First rate news and eye gripping pictures. On our reporters' Twitter and Instagram. To be in the know, follow us online. Did you know the press is the only industry specifically mentioned in the Constitution? That's because a free and open press is critical to our democracy. Strike alpha. Roll alpha. In fact, the single biggest threat facing our nation today is the corporate takeover of our government and our press. We've been hijacked by a handful of powerful transnational corporations that will profit by destroying what our founding fathers once built up. I'm Tom Hartman, and on this show, we reveal the big picture of what's actually going on in the world. We go beyond identifying the problem. We try to fix it. Rational debate and a real discussion of the critical issues facing America. Stand by on camera, go. Ready to join the movement? Then welcome to the big picture. Welcome back to Worlds Apart, where we are discussing religion and politics with evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Now, uh, the main premise of most Abrahamic religions is the, the so-called golden rule, the rule of reciprocity. And uh, in the Selfish Gene, you, you wrote that, um, about that game theory analysis that shows that reciprocity is an evolutionarily sustainable uh, strategy. And I wonder if uh, what you believe in is more important than how you believe. Because your case is obviously against uh, how people believe in certain things that you know you, you have to uh, you know think rationally, you have to employ critical thinking. But at the end of the day, good people of you know faith and good people of atheism, they 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 all seem to believe in the same thing that they you have to be fair and treat others as you want to be treated. Yes, the golden rule is pretty much universal in all societies, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, What's objectionable is when religious people claim that you need religion in order to be good to, to other people. Of course you don't. And if, you, if people really did base their morality upon religion, um, they would uh, by no means be doing the sorts of things that you and I both agree they should be doing. They would be stoning people to death um, uh, for adultery, um, for homosexuality, etc. Et so we don't, as a matter of fact, get our morals from religion. Uh, we get them from somewhere else, things like moral philosophy, which, which is often just an elaboration of the golden rule and other things. We get it from that. It happens to coincide with some verses of religious scripture, very much does not coincide with other verses of religious scripture. We pick and choose which verses of religious scripture, the religious people pick and choose which verses of religious scripture they want to believe. The basis on which they pick and choose is the same as the basis that you and I use in order to decide what's moral. It's not other parts of scripture. I would like to ask you perhaps a sexist question, but uh, there, there are a lot of studies that show that um, for males, uh, you know, how you do certain things is more, uh, more important than for females. For example, in war zones, uh, valor and honor are male values, predominantly male values. Women tend to compromise for the sake of their loved ones. Uh, I mean, for them, even though they're more attuned to public opinion, uh, in critical situations, they're ready to sacrifice that. And that led me thinking that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, what some would call the strident form of atheism is perhaps a male construct, because for most women, it doesn't really, or for many women, it doesn't really matter whether somebody, again, uh, believes in, uh, in the Bible or in Allah, as long as they are decent human beings, as long as they uh, function in, in a society in a way that doesn't threaten anyone. I hesitate to, uh, to tie labels on sexes of that sort. Uh, there could be evidence for that. I could imagine psychological evidence for, for that. I haven't looked, it, looked into it. Um, I, uh, I think we need to 
discuss in a civilized way the, the differences between these two ways of looking at things. And I'd, I'd, be, I'd be hesitant before I tied uh, gender labels on them. But I mean, the reason I'm asking, of course, is because many people believe that uh, you know, you're very principled and some would say strident position on that. You, uh, you put it on the intellectual basis. You believe that it's intellectually driven. And uh, I wonder if you ever thought about uh, it also being influenced by gender factors. And uh, you know, we, we see similar uh, phenomenon, for example, in organized religion, when, again, most of the uh, high priests are also male. And uh, those who indoctrinate and postulate uh, you know, values, they also happen to be male. I value uh, the world of the mind. I value truth. I care passionately about what's true. And so to me, as an individual, when I look at a religion, what I care about is, is it true? Is it really true that there is, is a God, etc.? Um, I recognize that emotions are also important. I'm driven by emotion in other issues. I'm driven by emotion, for example, in um, the question of um, saving species from going extinct, things like rhinoceroses, elephants, tigers. Um, these, uh, it, it's quite hard to build a purely rational case mm -hmm. for saving the elephant, saving the black rhino, saving the tiger. Um, my case is an emotional one, and I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, I've, I've, I would weep if we lost, if we lost the, the two elephant uh, species that we, that, that we have. That's emotional, and I defend it on those grounds. Religion is, to me, a matter of intellect, and uh, I, I take my stand on that. Now, uh, the traditional atheist view has been that with the development of science, religion will sort of die out. And obviously, this is not what we are seeing these days. And, um, you know, if you look at uh, some of the IS fighters, uh, there are reports that some of them have advanced scientific degrees. You know, there are chemists and physicists among them. And yet, they seem to have this ability of, uh, you know, uh, using critical thinking in one domain and going totally blind in... Uh, other areas of life, and I wonder if uh, atheism in some way overestimates people's ability to think rationally. Are you putting too much faith in the human rationality? Well, it looks as though you may be right. I mean, it is, it is quite mysterious to me the way people can do that. Uh, identity politics in the case of IS is no doubt part of it. I think they, there is a capacity in the human mind to separate things out. I, it's not just in Muslims, it's in Christians as well. There are, there are scientists who are perfectly competent, not, not brilliant scientists, but they're, they're competent scientists who write, I mean, there's an extreme case known to me of an American professor of astronomy who uh, writes competent mathematical papers about astrophysics, which make the assumption that the universe is, whatever it is, 13 billion years old. But, but privately, he believes the universe is only 6,000 years old. Uh, so that shows that it's possible for an apparently intelligent and academically competent mind to be split in half and to go through the motions of writing papers in astrophysics while, while believing the, everything about his paper is nonsense. Um, that's an extreme case. And what we see much more often is less extreme cases of the same thing. Now, uh, I was born in the Soviet Union, and um, you know, one of the things that um, made communism uh, degenerate into what we had in later years is uh, that communist ideologues essentially um, either oversimplified uh, or overestimated the human nature, you know, that they didn't take into account all the uh, various impulses of, uh, of people. And uh, I wonder if... Um, you would actually like to live in a world you know, with only agnostics and atheists all around. Wouldn't that be a place that perhaps uh, could also degenerate into something that uh, we had in the Soviet Union? Because communism at the beginning was uh, you know, also a theoretical concept. It talked about you know, the goodness of people sharing, you know, abandoning private property because you don't need it. You, you know, it counted too much on the better side of uh, human rationality. But at the end of the day, uh, it brought out the worst. Can atheism do the same? Well, you may be saying it's realistic. Sorry, that you may be saying it's unrealistic to uh, count on, on human nature. But I still think it's worthwhile ideal. I mean, I would like to live in a society where people are rational and skeptical and 
critical, and that I think means they would be atheistic. We live in a society now where nobody believes in fairies and in pig unicorns and things, and that's fine. I, I think I would like to live in a society where people are critical, skeptical, rational, believe things only when there's evidence and not because of tradition or emotion or revelation or holy books or priesthoods. Have you ever thought uh, how much critical thinking may be too much? I mean, uh, is there a limit beyond which uh, it may get... Uh... No, I don't think there is. I mean, th you don't want to apply the sort of extreme skeptical critical thinking to uh, ordinary personal relationships, you know, does, do, does my lover love me or not? That, that we, we, we use human faculties for that. Uh, it would be, uh, life would be unpleasant if we were constantly uh, seeking evidence and, and doubting our loved ones. So, no, but when it comes to beliefs about the real world, about, uh, about uh, science, about, uh, about religion, um, then I think, yes, I do, th I do want people to be skeptical and critical. And um, I heard you often talk about, or people rather, asking you about, um, you know, religious art, and you always reply that, for example, the existence of Sistine cha Chapel is not uh, proof of the um, belief system that helped to bring it about. But I wonder if you see anything in common between uh, creativity and religion, in a sense of both of them providing some sort of escape from rule-bound world, because uh, on some level you can even argue that uh, religion is uh, just an example of human creativity, creativity of thought, and you know, just uh, giving yourself uh, some respite from you know, the bounds of logic. I'm all for having uh, a respite from, from all sorts of things, music, poetry, um, human love, uh, um, art, but I would draw the line at using false beliefs about the universe for that for that purpose. I don't mind poetic. Uh, I mean, I could I can appreciate the poetry of say uh, Bach's Saint Matthew Passion, um, beautiful music, and it, the words go with it. I, do, I don't discount the words. I, I, it's a tragic story that that that, that is being told. I appreciate tragic stories, even if they're not true. Like I appreciate Romeo and Juliet, although it's not, it's, it, although it's fiction. Um, so yes, we, we take refuge in fiction. But don't let's forget that it is fiction. That's the point I would make. Um, and finally, I wonder if religion stop, would stop making those um, unsubstantiated claims uh, about the origins of the universe and would embrace some sort of, um, uh, let's say, uh, definition of God that would be uh, similar to Einstein's, would you be willing to drop your objections against uh, religion? Uh, how do you see the evolution of it? I would have no objection to an Einsteinian religion, so long as people don't confuse it with supernaturalism. I think that Einstein made a mistake in using religious language uh, because people have been misled by that. I mean, Einstein used the word God and he didn't actually believe in any kind of God. Um, he was a, a, a pantheist, and I'd be happy to go along with that kind of religion. I just wouldn't call it religion. But how do you see the, uh, the future of religion? If, we, if you seem to be agreeing that uh, you know, the social and emotional function that it serves is a very important one, do you see any institution that uh, could either substitute that or a way in which religion could evolve? You know, if, if I just ask you to use your imagination and, let's say, imagine relig uh, religion in 100 years. I wouldn't call it religion. I, mean, I, th I think we, we, we need uh, human comfort, the psychological comfort, human comfort, emotional counselling, all these sorts of things. People get help from each other. We're a social species. Uh, we've, we, we put our arms around each other to comfort each other. We don't need supernatural spooks in order to do that. Absolutely, but uh, my point is that religion as of now is pretty much uh, the only or perhaps a very rare social institution that has these open door policies. You know, science doesn't. You have to, you know, meet certain criteria no, to be a scientist. science doesn't, but, 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 but counselling does, psychology does. But you have to pay for that. The religion provides it free well, of charge. Well, then we shouldn't. I mean, I'd, I would like to see a more socialistic um, approach to that kind of thing, to mental health. So you're advocating the return to the Soviet Union? <laughs> I think um, social goodwill is something that we can achieve without um, overbearing dicta dictatorial um, uh, uh, ordering about. Well, Mr. Dawkins, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. And 
Please join the conversation on our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook pages and I hope to see you again same place, same time here on Worlds Apart.